voice, let's stand as we sing. There's sunshine in my soul today, more glorious and bright, than blows in any earthly skies, for Jesus is my light. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in the soul. There's music in my soul today, a carol to the King. And Jesus, a listening, can hear the songs I cannot sing. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There's springtime in my soul today, for when the Lord is near, the dove of peace sings in my heart, the flowers of grace appear. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful, happy moments roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. There's gladness in my soul today, and hope and praise and love for blessings which he gives me now, for joys laid up above. Oh, there's sunshine, blessed sunshine, when the peaceful roll. When Jesus shows his smiling face, there is sunshine in my soul. Well, good evening. It's good to see everybody. And I'm glad that you can make it to our midweek Bible study. And uh, let's look to the Lord, ask Him to bless our time together. Father, we thank You. Your grace and goodness are always so good. We're so thankful that Your light shines within our soul because of Jesus Christ. And we're so thankful for all that You've done for us through Him. And I pray, Lord, that for me. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in his beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. You may be seated. We'll take some prayer requests. Do I hear an echo? <laughs> it's like, wow. All right, I thought, man, I'm losing it. I, I know I'm not far from it, okay, but I might have done lost it this time. So thankfully, it's not just me. This was your chance to be like, no, we don't. We don't hear a thing. And then that's it. I would have officially considered myself crazy. Y'all missed a golden opportunity, so that's on you. 
All right, a few prayer requests um, that have come in. Um, pray for the Lopez family. They are in Guatemala, and they will be there until Saturday. I did get a text message. Um, things, be, things seem to be going very well, and in fact, I think Juan is really excited to come back and, and give us a, a, a report, um, which uh, if initial indications are, are anything, he's going to try to convince me to convince us to go to Guatemala next year, and I'm, I'm very open to being convinced for that. So, um, But you pray for them. They are down there and um, doing a great work, and I've seen some some interesting pictures and some pictures of them ministering to some folks, and so it's just a it's just a blessing to see their desire for that. But pray for them to have wisdom. Miss um, Charlene had surgery today around uh, noon or so. I haven't gotten an update um, uh, about how that went or how she's doing. So please just continue to pray, um, pray for Miss Charlene and uh, and Brother Sid as well. Also, um, an important update about my sister-in-law Beth. Of course. Um, um, all of you know that she had surgery, uh, boy, about a week ago or so, uh, plus or minus, and the surgery went really well and everything was fine. She went back in for a follow-up uh, yesterday and uh, received some, some very difficult news. Uh, they originally thought that the cancer was ovarian cancer. Um, after they got back the pathology, it turns out that it is uterine cancer. Um, the, the significant difference being with ovarian cancer, she would have been able to kind of go back to normal after a little bit more chemo treatments. Uh, there is no cure. There is no cure for uterine cancer. So this is um, this is this is terminal, basically. So they said, on average, um, they said, well, the, the 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 span is could be two years, could be twenty years. Um, but usually two to five. And so lots of questions that we don't have answers to yet. So we're trying to, we, the collective, we are trying to figure that out. <clears throat> um, right now the plan is she will undergo radiation treatment five days a week for five weeks. And then after that, she'll go back to chemotherapy uh, once every three weeks. And so, uh, so that'll be about another, that'll be nine, nine, nine weeks after that. So whatever nine plus five is, what is that, 14? I think I did math right publicly for the first time. Um, so, unless that's wrong, some of you are looking at me like that might, now I'm, now I'm second guessing myself. <clears throat> that's all right, you'll humor me. Um, but we have a lot of questions, we don't have a lot of answers, um, but we're trying to figure it out. And so that just happened yesterday, so if you'll continue to pray for Beth, um, and really, our whole family, we would appreciate that. And I think, I think that's all I got right now. Um, anybody else with a prayer request? Yes. Okay, and so I, maybe I don't understand the nature of the, like they're, one's in Spain and one is in the States. Oh, okay. Oh, okay, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. And so, no, 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 it's, it's fine. So she is, um, so her husband is, her father is in some sort of um, distress and she can't leave. Is that is that right? Okay. All right. <clears throat> okay. So, um Melanie's father is um is struggling with his health and no one knows just how much time he may have and she and Melanie is stuck in Spain and can't come come home okay all right so we'll pray we'll pray for that um, anybody else yes Lynn yeah he told me about that
That was a plus, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that's give, right? Okay. Well, God knows, so it'll be okay. <clears throat> All right. So pray for Tom as he um, has another opportunity to preach this coming Sunday, and his job's going well. And uh, Lena's apparently fearful that he's going to fall off the roof. So pray for that specifically and for Gibb and his salvation. He's the gentleman that has had some heart surgeries and conditions and challenges there. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Well, we'll pray for Jonathan's father and for Jonathan. <clears throat> um, his dad has bone cancer and is elected to not receive treatment. So um, pray for comfort and peace and grace during this time. Anybody else? Yes, Jim. Wow. Amen. So Jess's dad's aunt's roommate, sort of. Got it. Everyone got that? Lots of apostrophe S's there. That's that's exciting, man. That's fantastic. You never know. Divine appointments, man. That's that's fantastic. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, Derek. Yes, sir. That's what I'm writing down. You must have seen what I was jotting down up here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Ethan. God answers prayers. Okay. Ethan has a decision. And let me and let me just say, um, takes a lot of personal courage to tell a church that you feel clueless. It takes a lot of courage. Um, so I commend you for that. As much as I like to tease you, seriously, it takes a lot of courage to come out with that humility and uh, to ask for prayer. And so I appreciate that. Um, I went home thinking about that. I thought, man, and I think I, I might have had some conversations. I thought, man, we're, we really are all clueless. Only some of us are wise enough to admit it. And so uh, thank you for doing that. But we'll continue to pray that now that a clue has been found, um, decisions will be made, and that will be wonderful. Anybody else? <clears throat> All right. I reversed it a little bit this week because everything's an experiment. So we're going to have our missionary letter. And um, brother, are you prepared? All right, yes. I knew you were. So come on down. You're the next person behind the pulpit and I will take the easy our missionary letter uh, from tonight is from the Whitmores they're uh, missionaries in Brazil uh, they're with uh, Fundamental Baptist Missions International and I'll read uh, parts of their letter uh, for us here this evening New Life Baptist Church celebrated its 7th anniversary September 17 to 18 there were 182 people present 
uh, for one of the services with several visitors and at least four people hearing the gospel during the invitation. I was able to visit a man named Lorazo Demas, an elderly man with his wife, Luzia. They observed their church while in their first two rented locations um, back as far as 2015. He noticed that our church was different because we had entire families going to church. In the past, when we have spoken with him and his wife about salvation, they have not listened. However, on Saturday, September 17th, when I visited them, Lorazo was home alone. He invited me into his home and listened with his eyes and his heart. To God be the glory, Lorazo chose to put his complete trust in Christ. Pray with us for his wife, Luzia, to be saved. She tells me that she will die in the Roman Catholic Apostolic Church. Praise the Lord that enough money was raised to cover the printing and shipping for 16,000 hardback Bibles. Please continue praying for the Beams Ministry based in Gulfport, Mississippi, and for Brother Harold Gilmer and his team at the Trinitarian Bible Society in Sao Paulo. Paulo. This ministry is being used by God to make an eternal difference here in Brazil and around the world. New Life Baptist Church hosted the second annual youth conference, July 14 through 16. Pray with us that the Holy Spirit would continue to use our teens to influence their friends and fellow students through soul winning and a separated life to see their need to be saved and join a church where they can learn, grow, and serve our Savior. The Gonhar ministry is in full swing. I'm not sure what that stands for, but the description follows. The container with John and Roman's tracks and soft cover Bibles arrived safely. Henrik, one of our faithful men, communicates on a voluntary basis with the 220 plus pastors and missionaries who received the Beans Bibles and those requesting the soul winning materials. An elderly man whose nickname was Vava passed away 12 days after he trusted Jesus. He also had the privilege of leading a man named Italo to Jesus as well. For the people of Brazil, Dave and Dawn, Carlene and Zachary, missionaries to Brazil. Gone, gone. Oh, gone hard. Gone hard. All right, I'm Mystery. not going to repeat not what I thought sure. you said. <clears throat> so the mic might have picked that up. I had pictures of Bruce Willis going through my head. I was like, what? Well, all right. Obviously wrong. It's not Christmas time yet. <clears throat> all right, so we'll pray for the Whitmores uh, in Brazil. And um, is there anyone that would like to pray for these or some of these requests this evening? Brother Barry, do you want to stay down there? You want to come up here? It's up to you. Okay.
Thank you, brother. <clears throat> All right, Proverbs chapter 7 tonight. Proverbs chapter 7. We're going to read the first five verses and <clears throat> we'll continue. This is kind of part two of where we left off at the conclusion of chapter 6. It's interesting how the book of Proverbs flows from one subject to the next um, here in these first nine chapters, which by the way are intended to convince us that we need the Proverbs. There's a little secret about the Proverbs. The first nine chapters are not the Proverbs. <laughs> it's um, convincing you and me, um, hey, you really need the Proverbs, and here's all the reasons why. <laughs> and so as we continue to go through this, um, we'll see just why our wonderful counselor wants to continue to convince us to work in this way. And this is so much better than the American proverb that I came up with, or that I, that I, that I recalled to my mind today, and that's, Always give 100% in everything you do, except in giving blood, all right? <clears throat> now let's read the inspired text. Proverbs chapter 7. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live and my law as the apple of thine eye. Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, boy, there she is again, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Tonight's message is about avoiding the tactics of sexual temptation. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word of truth, Lord, as we approach this subject once again, according to your word, I pray that we will have the wisdom we need to rightly and correctly apply your truth to our life, to heed the warnings, but also to be understanding of how all these things will come together and how we can avoid them before we get drawn in ourselves. So Father, use this wisdom to help us prevent many a disaster in our life. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In this world, it's said that some people are playing checkers while other people are playing chess. And that is, some people are simply just jumping around in life. They're jumping from color to color, perhaps without much of a strategy, while others are plotting specifically how they can go about achieving their goals. Now we're confronted once again tonight by a wise father, a sage who's coming to talk to his son again about sex and sexuality. Why? Why does this keep coming up? If you're not wondering that, I certainly was. Well, in a manner of speaking, it's because some people are playing checkers while others are playing chess. That is, there are fools who are just falling into the traps, from one trap right into the next, to go from temptation to temptation to temptation, and they are none the wiser. And what they don't realize, perhaps, sadly so, is that they are being targeted. Someone is targeting them for nothing more than personal pleasure and, and gratification. That is why we need to learn about biblical sexuality. The sage counselor, the father here, is not just beating a dead horse. He's trying to help us understand 
this massively significant area of life, which is why in Proverbs chapter 6 and beginning of verse 20, he had some instructions to give to his son, and, and now he's going to continue that. Now, of course, it's addressed to his son, but it applies to women just as equally. Now, previously, we looked at the consequences of sexual folly and the discord that it brings. Tonight, we will look at the specific tactics and techniques of sexual temptation. That is, Proverbs 7 explores how sexual temptation appears in our life in order to show us how it works and also how to avoid it. So we want to protect ourselves against sexual temptations first and foremost. So we'll read again verses 1 through 5, which address how we can experience protection against these temptations. My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. Keep my commandments and live. And my law, as the apple of thine eye, bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. Say unto wisdom, thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman, that they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. Now, this beginning here is Old Testament poetic language for which the New Testament simply calls being born again of the Holy Spirit. Then someone experiences salvation. That means they experience something deep with inside of them that changes because of God's divine work in their life. When we start, when we trust God, we start treasuring God's commandments from the heart. It's not merely external, it is internal. And we start to guard God's word like a treasure. Not only do we treasure them, but we guard those words like a treasure and we make them the center, the focus of our life. That's why the, uh, the father here uses the phrase, make them the apple of your eye. The pupil, that is the center of your eye, is one of the most sensitive and carefully guarded parts of the body. One of the, uh, one of the things is because it is exposed, it wants to protect itself at all costs. So that way, even little things, if you, if you want to do this real quick, you can try to poke yourself in the eye. Anybody, anybody want to anybody wanna demonstrate that? Yes, yeah, see, I have, I have protection, right? I'm protected against the temptation of poking myself in the eye. But it's very sensitive, and if you've ever poked yourself in the eye, you know it's, it's, it can be very painful. So we want to keep God's word as the center focus. That is, we want to be sensitive to it. That, that when the word of God speaks, we don't become callous or develop cataracts and go, ah, oh, I've seen this before. Oh, it's fine. Oh, this old story again. Oh, okay, yeah, I've learned this before. Oh, another principle, got it, check, and you move on. Be sensitive, be sensitive. When we start losing our sensitivity to the word of God, we become that much more susceptible to the temptations that are waiting out there. We, we want to look at wisdom. We want to look at the word of God the way that uh, someone in the Old Testament would look at their sister. Now, Back then, they considered a sister an intimate relative. In fact, the word sister uh, had such an intimate connotation that sometimes the word sister was used as a synonym for somebody's wife. And you can read about that in the Song of Solomon's, uh, Song of Solomon, uh, verses uh, chapters four and five, where that word and that connotation is specifically used there. And then similarly, we we keep knowledge, we keep wisdom and understanding as a sister, and as a kinswoman. We want them as close as we possibly can. We think about that word kinsman from the story of Ruth and Boaz. We need the word of God to play that role that Boaz did. What did he do? He redeemed Ruth. The word of God is the source of our redemption, and it is still the source of our deliverance from temptation. Christ always gives us an exit in that temptation. There's no temptation uh, that, has, uh, been, that, that we've gone through that's not common to man. But Christ is faithful. God is faithful to do what? To give us an escape. What is that escape? The word of God. 
that is being treasured in our heart. That is the tool of deliverance to overcome the temptation. We're supposed to be people that are saying to God's wisdom and about God's wisdom, I want you more than anything, more than this man, more than this woman, more than the seductive words that I'm hearing come out of her mouth. I, I want to say to wisdom, you're my sister. You're as close as I could possibly be. You're my kinswoman. It, it doesn't get any more intimate than this. I need you more than I need whatever this strange woman thinks she's going to offer me. Now, if you have not made the Bible your daily guide, your guardian, your companion on this journey of faith, then you are in danger. Now, perhaps we've become so accustomed to hearing about the Bible and devotions and making it the central focus that our hearts have just glossed over to it. Now, we, we've heard it so much, we don't hear it anymore. But there's no getting around that Bible reading and Bible practicing are essential. Now, is the Christian life more than reading the Bible? Yes, but it's never less than reading the Bible. Now, here's my question. This is an honest question because I need you to help me so I can help you. All right? My question for you, what do you need to help you become or remain committed to daily discipleship? Okay? I can do things for you already on Sundays, and I guess today's Wednesday. What concerns me is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. Now, you don't need a police officer. I take joy in being your pastor, and I don't have to police people, which, by the way, is not my job. But I want to encourage you, I want to equip you, so that way when you leave on Sunday and you're refreshed and you're pumped up and, and you're excited to take on the world and something crazy happens on Monday, that you're okay. That you have the resources available. Now, I'm a resource, but honestly, not always available. <laughs> uh, that's just the truth. I wish I could be. But my question for you is within my, the human constraints that are natural to me, what can I do to help you Monday through Saturday? What can the church do? We have, we have an app, we have websites, we have tools. Can we make that better? Can we improve upon it? What can you do on your own to help solidify your Monday through Saturday discipleship? Those are honest questions with an honest intention that if you need more, I and we need to be here to help you Monday through Saturday, to the, to the extent possible. Because this is serious. Temptation is everywhere. A temptation of every variety, of course. And of course, in context, uh, there's always sexual temptations that are lurking around out there. And I have found, as, and, and I'm sure you have too, that if you are going to make it through this world with a thriving, a thriving relationship with God, then the Bible has to become an indispensable part of your daily life. If it's not there, what can we do to get it there? It's not a criticism. It's a way of saying this is what we can do to take the next step in our life. And we'll see that if we're not careful... <clears throat> There is someone else lurking out there. There's another person out there lurking just outside, metaphorically speaking, to attempt to lure us, to seduce us into following a different way. But the father, here in our text, sees something, and he wants his son to see this, and thankfully it's written down, preserved for us, so we can see it right along with him. Now, as we read this text and see what the father sees, what he sees out of his window, um, he's going to see something and share something, and those are the two tactics that are used primarily in sexual temptation, and then he will reveal the outcome of succumbing to those temptations. Now, we're going to look here. The first tactic of sexual temptation is the approach by the strange woman. Let's read in verses 6 through 13 together. For at the window of my house, 
I looked through my casement and beheld among the simple ones. I discerned among the youths, a young man. Check out this, this, this uh, description. Void of understanding. That's, that's a nice Old Testament way of saying, you know, wisdom's been trying to catch you, but you've outrun it every time. <laughs> or you're being a fool. How about that? Verse number eight, passing through the streets, this is what this young, simple, foolish boy is doing, passing through the street near her corner, and he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night, and behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud, stubborn, her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without now in the streets, and lieth in wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, to be continued. We'll come right back to that. The suspense is building. So now here we have this story unfold. Like I said, the father, he sees something, and he wants his teenage son to see it too, so that way he can walk into adulthood fully alert about what's going on. Now, who's involved here? Well, there's the man, in this case, who is one of the simple ones. Now, we've seen this simple one before in Proverbs chapter 1, and we see that they're just open. And this openness is actually going to be his doom, because the problem is, is that that's not just a description of who he is uh, as, as far as he doesn't have any knowledge. It also represents his attitude. That means he's open to anything. He's going to go out and explore life. All of his options are open. He remains uncommitted. He just wants to see what's out there. We may say he wants to sow his wild oats, not realizing that when you sow wild oats, you reap wild wheat. So this particular simpleton is feeling restless. It's early one evening, and he takes a walk goes out for a stroll. He's curious. He's uh, heard about a certain part of town, or maybe he knows about certain sites on the internet, as we would say. Now, in the town where I grew up in, everybody knew this part of town. If someone said anything about Wabash Street, we all knew what that meant. I don't know if y'all had something like that, but anything that you were looking for, any type of trouble could all be found conveniently located on Wabash Street. In Okinawa, it was Gate 2 Street. Yeah, some of you that have been there, you know it's Gate 2 Street. What happens, what, is there anything good that happens on Gate 2 Street? No, you got your last chance, you got your first chance, and everything. There's a seventh heaven, and let me, let me tell you, you that there's nothing heavenly about, about that place. There's always a spot somewhere where you know, and kids know, they don't like to be called kids, teenagers know, where they can go and get what it is they're looking for. Well, this simpleton knew that as well. And so he goes, and he's probably thinking, you know, I got this, I can handle this, I'm strong, and I need to see these things that are out there. I need to experience life for myself. I am. I'm grown up, actually. I'm already grown. I'm man enough to handle this. And behold. <laughs> and behold. Let's pick up in verse number 10 and behold what is going on. We've read it before. Let's read it again. Behold, there met him a woman with the attire of a harlot and subtle of heart. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and wait at every corner. So she caught him and kissed him. Now the idea here of being subtle of heart means guarded of heart. Now this is interesting because you wouldn't expect a woman described as a harlot who has this party lifestyle. She's loud. She's stubborn. She insists on having a good time. We're not going home till, uh, you know, until the sun comes up. Okay, very well. But there's going to be trouble that's lurking in the near future. She's subtle of heart. So what does it mean that she's guarded of heart? Well, 
she's clearly unguarded in her dress. So she has the attire of a harlot. She is not subtly dressed. She is revealing much. But she's guarded in her heart, revealing nothing about her heart. And what that means is there are men and women who just don't know what it means to have a relationship. They don't know what a real relationship is. They've never experienced a real relationship with someone of the opposite gender, and they have no idea, so they just role play. They role play a relationship, but they don't give their hearts away. They keep that back. So what does that mean in just blunt terminology? They give sex, but themselves they guard. In fact, the, the rejoinder that is so popular now is, it's just sex. Oh, that's, that's all it is. They, they've actually coined this uh, as, as a culture, the hookup culture. And, and, and it's a real problem. It is a real problem that's facing young people, especially those in college. In fact, one study showed that over 72% of college students will hook up before they graduate. Some colleges, even colleges like Harvard, uh, will require students to attend seminars and workshops about everything from sex to alcohol and drugs. But what do they teach there? They don't advise about what's right or wrong. They will advise on what is considered safe or unsafe or what is legal or illegal or really what's generally permissible if you can get away with it. Now, if you take that mentality, the hookup culture, combine it with the party culture, with minimal responsibility, access to alcohol, and distance from home, what do you have? You have an equation for casual sex. But both science and scripture confirm that sex outside of the confines of the committed, exclusive relationship of marriage distorts and perverts our capacity to value one another. Today they call it a body count. It's just the hookup culture. It's just Proverbs 7, relabeled. The whole hookup culture undermines and even prevents people from forming genuine relationships. What does that mean? She's subtle of heart. She doesn't know how to have a real relationship, and neither does he. So they just pretend. They role play and act as though they're boyfriend and girlfriend. I've even seen some unmarried people refer to each other as husband and wife. They're just role playing. It's just a game. They think if they call it that, then somehow it's okay. Now, this adulteress and this foolish boy, if they actually valued relationships, especially for her, she valued the relationship she has with her husband, you know, the guy we haven't talked about yet, then they certainly wouldn't settle for the falsely so-called casual sex. Because casual sex requires neither respect nor companionship. There's no real intimacy. They're just being used as tools for personal gratification. Now, the seductive approach revealed in this passage is a carefree, pleasure-seeking, self-gratifying act that really turns out to be an uphill battle against God, an uphill battle against the way God designed us. We're battling against ourselves, and we're battling against any meaningful relationship that we might hope to form. Now watch out for her approach, but be attentive also to her speech. This is the second tactic of sexual temptation. We'll read again in verse 13. There's a little bit of overlap here, and we'll read down to verse 20. And she caught him and kissed him, and <clears throat> with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace off <clears throat> excuse me, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. Maybe I should go back and read this. We're just gonna, before I go on to the rest of the verses here, let's read it a little bit more dramatically. She caught him with an impudent face and said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. Therefore came I forth to meet thee. 
oh, the man of my dreams. Sorry, that's a parenthesis. Diligently to seek thy face. <gasps> and I have found thee. Oh, oh, yes. I'm so excited. This young guy thought he had it made, but he had no idea what he's walking into. Now, back in the day, that is in those days, religious sacrifices could include a meal from the meat of a sacrificed animal. Now, that was a luxury. So when she has offerings, she's offering him something luxurious, as we'll see here in a moment, that rich people were the only ones to have furniture. So when she invites him to lounge and enjoy the furniture, this is a guy's dream come true. He's living in the lap of luxury. So, so here the woman is basically saying, now, now not only am I caught up on all my religious requirements, but I've also got a feast with extra special food waiting at home just for you. It's a special occasion like prom night or Mardi Gras. Come on, everybody, everybody needs a break. Let, 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 let's, let's just enjoy the evening. And I want to share this with you. Ah, but the plot thickens like a nice gravy getting ready to go on those biscuits. Let's see what happens to the wayward wife here in this melodrama. Let's continue with verses 16 and 17. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. Rich, 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 rich. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Only the rich could afford these, afford these extravagances. The, the beautiful smell, the bed, the perfumes, all of this, the carvings, the tapestries. Tapestries? Tapestries? She's got rugs that she doesn't need, so she hung them up on the wall. This kid has hit the jackpot. He's never seen it like this before. A beautiful woman, a great feast, a luxurious setting, exotic experiences, all just waiting for him. And he can have his fill. Just as verse 18 says, Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with love. And in essence, she's saying, let's saturate ourselves with lovemaking in all of its forms. Let's enjoy every act that we could conceive of all night long, slowly passing the night, no hurry, whatever you want. This guy thinks his fantasies are coming true, not realizing the guy is living in a fantasy land. It's all based on lies. One commentator observed this. Say physically, I'm giving myself to you while emotionally and spiritually holding back from covenanted commitment is in fact to live a lie. And like all lies, they have to remain secretive. Shh. Let's read verse 19 and 20. For the good man is not at home. <laughs> He's on a long journey. <laughs> he hath taken a bag of money with him. And he will come home at the appointed day. Shh. It's just us. <laughs> and I've been waiting for you. Nobody will ever know. Do you know if she's willing to betray her husband? Why well, does this fool think that he's anybody special to her. She's not going to be any more fair. The offer is sin without regret. Boy, isn't that exactly the lie that Satan packaged in the Garden of Eden? It'll all work out. Don't worry about it. No one will ever know. In fact, it will make you a better person. You'll know good from evil. What could go wrong? <laughs> what could go wrong? Now when, not if, but when a man or a woman tempts you with the assurance that no one will ever know what they are really saying to you is, God does not exist. That's the only 
way, no one would ever know. You have to believe that God does not know all or see all, but the eyes of the Lord wander to and fro throughout the whole earth. The eyes of the Lord behold both good and evil. God sees everything. The lie no one will ever know is an attempt to get you to believe your God isn't real. Now, as a Christian, to state the obvious, under no circumstances, under no circumstances, should we ever live as though God is not real, because to do so is to live a lie. Now, having seen her approach and her speech, we now will see the outcome of sexual temptation, which is probably at this point a foregone conclusion. Nevertheless, we will read as we continue on. Now, verses 21 through 27, we'll pick up a little bit at a time. Now, this young man, on an impulse, falls for the temptation in verse number 21. With her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. That's it. That's his downfall right there. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. And all at once, this fool follows her to his demise. Verse 22, he goeth after her straightway. <laughs> straightway. As an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. Why like a dumb ox? Why? It's simple. You've heard this verse so many times, but it is the plain truth. The wages of sin is death. They just are. The wages of sin is death. We cannot change that by any amount of wishful thinking. We can't think, we can't think that what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It doesn't. You don't come back whole from places like Vegas and the despicable things that can take place there. It's amazing. It's amazing, rabbit trail. It's amazing that a whole city can revolve its entire media campaign around the atheistic mentality that God does not exist and anything goes because no one will ever see. All right, I caught the rabbit. But it is true that sin and its consequences do never, do not ever just disappear. But by the time this young man, this fool, feels the impact, it's too late. By the time he realizes what's going on, the knife is already at his throat. He's gone. There's nothing left. But you know, he's not the only one. History is like a battlefield with casualties of sexual folly lying everywhere. Let's read verses 26 and 27. For she hath cast down many. She hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Many a victim, you could say, she has laid low. And all of her slain are like a mighty multitude. These aren't weaklings in their profession. They're just fools. From preachers to presidents. doesn't matter if you keep the church programs going or if you keep the, the economy strong. doesn't matter. Sexual folly has ensnared, wounded, and slain many, many people all up and down the ranks. So please, don't think that it can't happen to you. It could happen to anybody. The destruction of their life feels like they've been defeated by an enormous enemy, thoroughly overthrown, so much so that everything that mattered to them is now all lost. They've lost everything. Or to put it another way, checkmate. Some people are playing checkers. And they foolishly just jump from color to color without any rhyme or reason. And some are out there playing chess, targeting the fools and the simpletons to achieve their objectives. Please, don't become someone who foolishly plays checkers, who foolishly falls into the traps and temptations when we know through the word that there are people out there targeting us 
just for their pleasure. This ring does not deter everybody. The word of God through me by his grace has to deter any onslaught of the enemy. Now what happens when you're tempted? In chess, we play to protect our king. In the Christian life, King Jesus plays to protect us. Rely on him. Lean on his grace. God is love. He is the real love that we've been looking for in this world. It's not out there with a strange woman or a strange man. The Christian life is to be a daily experience of growing in the love of God, to embrace him, to experience him, to see him more clearly, to follow him more nearly, and to love him more dearly. We love him because he first loved us. What love, what love we've experienced. So when it's time for you to stare down temptation, lean heavy on the experience of God's love through Jesus Christ as you remember the scriptures and you will not fall prey to these tactics of sexual temptation. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the wisdom of these warnings. I pray, Father, that you will keep us and deliver us from temptation. And God, that you will help us to be wise and discerning and to flee from these trepidations that we may glorify you. Help us to remember your great love when we face these challenges and be glorified in our decisions. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so uh, a couple of announcements and a couple of requests. Well, one request, really. Um, tonight we had a blood drive um, and over in the Buddy Building, and they should be cleared out or mostly cleared out, so if we could get some folks to go over there and just set up the tables and chairs again. Uh, many hands make light work, so I'd appreciate that. Also, on Sunday in Sunday School, I mentioned um, uh, for a couple of Sundays, if you're interested in the encyclopedia that I referenced, which is basically a, an encyclopedia about the Christian life and, and uh, as a tool to help you study the Bible on your own, uh, please let me know. I can show you, what, uh, show you what that looks at. You can peruse it a little bit and um, see if you're interested in, in kind of getting one for yourself as well. Um, so let me know. I wanna, I'm going to keep reminding us about that um, because I think some people want it, but they just keep forgetting. So um, there's the encyclopedia. The Ladies' Fellowship... Uh, on the 20th is going to be over at the Browns house. That's kind of a war order for you. So if you haven't made plans to clear the area, now you, you got you got a heads up now. So please, you know, be advised. Um, so if you don't know where that is, we can get you we can get you the address offline, and um, make sure you get the right code because people in gated communities are really pretentious sometimes. Okay, I'm just saying, just saying, I'm just gonna put that out there. All right, now we're about a month from the fall festival, all right? And uh, Lisa and I were brainstorming uh, some cool stuff, and she had some great ideas that I'm going to steal as my own because I'm both a man and a husband, and that's what we do. So, um, And she's not in here to roll her eyes at me and stop me. So um, that's how that's going to be. We would like to do a chili cook-off. How many of you would like to cook something for the chili cook-off? We can't eat chili unless somebody... One, two, three, okay... Oh, man. All right. I already see fierce competition. All right. Um, pumpkin dessert contest. Any kind of dessert, but it has to be pumpkin. All right. And not faux pumpkin. All right. I'm serving up pumpkin spice sermons. I expect something similar um, from everybody else. All right. Uh, we'd like to do a cookout with burgers and dogs, um, uh, a hayride, maybe some kickball, but if... Uh, Three people show up for kickball. That's not going to be much of a game. And, of course, campfire and s'mores. So that's kind of where we're at right now. It's about a month away. In fact, I think it is on the 12th next month. And so I tell you that now so you can start thinking, hey, I want to do the chili cook-off. I want to do the pumpkin dessert thing, um, you know, things like that. Whatever you may need to prepare, uh, I want to give you a, a, a good, good amount of time to do that. And I think that's everything. Unless anyone's got anything for the good of the group. Very well. Let's uh, pray, and we'll be on our way. Father, we thank you. Your grace and love are so powerful and so, so, so much more than sufficient in our lives. And Father, I pray that as we go out into the world, that you will make us wise, help us to recall your scriptures that will guide us and lead us. And Lord, I pray that, uh, that your love will abound and that we will experience 
just the, the transformational desire to flee from those things which, which may assault us. And Father, I pray that you'll give us safety as we return home tonight. I pray that you will be glorified in our lives and be with us. Help us to return safely this weekend, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you next time. All right.